the bomb in the crate. Makne crept up to the crate and carefully broke open the lid. What is it? asked the children. Makne remained silent. Makne, what is it? Just papers. What's written on them? Death threats, declarations of war, ultimatums. Magni flipped through the pile of papers. No, these are just stories, he said. Stories? Yes, fairy tales and sagas and poems too. Poems? And there's a letter. Read it, said the children anxiously. Dear children, we hope you are still alive. We met your friends Hulda and Bremer the other day and they told us what a very hard time you've been having since the sun disappeared. We hope they got home in the air balloon which we gave them. Because your darkness is even blacker than ours, we really wanted to help you make your lives a little bit bearable and that's why we sent you food and blankets and stories and poems so you don't have to eat soil or get bored. Best wishes, the children by the firefly jar. Are the children in the darkness sending us food? asked the children, and they looked at the bombs in their hands. Jolly Good Day burst out laughing. Ha 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 ha, he said. They are so stupid, he shouted and rolled about laughing. They believed what Bremer and Hilda told them. They think that you're so hungry you eat nothing but soil. No one laughed except for a few who giggled self-consciously. Are they sending us blankets and poems? asked the children. Jolly Good Day laughed even more, bringing tears to his eyes. Ha <laughs> ha, said Jolly Good Day. I've never heard anything like it. They are in the cold and darkness and send blankets and food over to the sun and warmth because they think there's darkness here too. Why are they so kind to us? asked the children. I don't know, said Jolly Good Day. Some people must just be so stupid and gullible. The children stood on the shoreline and stared at the barrel they were planning to float over to the pale children. Flies buzzed all around it as food, blankets and old shoes were all mixed together in one pile. Okay now, carry on flying, kids, and let's forget all this. Ready, steady, off you go. But no one moved. What's the matter with you all? No one answered. Kids who live in the cold and darkness and give away blankets and rainbow trout must be so stupid that they don't deserve to have the sun where they live, said Jolly Good Day. They wouldn't know what to do with it. Get on flying now. The children stood on the beach with drooping heads. Elva was going to embrace Magni, but he was too slippery. Come with me, said Elva nudging Magni. Magni nudged Woody, who nudged Arnar, who nudged the next child, and they all glided up to Fairmost Falls. They landed by the waterfall that trickled like slime down into the canyon. The children peeled off the Teflon magic coating and threw it into the waterfall. The spray increased as more and more of the children threw the stuff into the waterfall, and its roar became louder and louder, until the thunder was almost deafening. In fact, it was so deafening that all the jokes Jolly Good Day had ever told them were totally forgotten. And then a large and beautiful rainbow formed over the canyon. The children closed their eyes and listened to the roar and looked at the spray fill the canyon. Then they flapped up to Mount Bright and dusted the butterfly powder carefully over the butterflies. The children embraced and kissed each other and then walked back. Many of them soon became very tired as they hadn't used their legs since the sun had been nailed to the sky. Their bones were weak, their joints stiff, and some of them found sticks to walk with. When they at last reached the beach, Jolly Good Day stood all alone on the shoreline, folding up his deck chair. Ignorant, ungrateful children, he muttered, I'm leaving. Why have we become so old and weak? asked the children. You sold me your youth for more fun. But now the fun is over. Can't we have our youth back? It's mine now. You sold me your youth. 
and I'll decide what I'm going to do with it. What are you going to do with our youth? We don't want to be gray-haired and weary. Youth is the most precious stuff in the world, said Jolly Good Day. It's more valuable than gold and diamonds, and it fuels my spaceship. With your youth, I should be able to reach the next solar system. And if I have any youth left, I can buy myself lots of friends. Don't you have any friends? asked the children. Jolly Good Day didn't answer, and they looked sadly at him. The spaceship's fuel tank was almost full. Are you going to use our youth as fuel and money? Are you going to leave us old and gray? But you think it's cool to be gray-haired. It's in fashion, said Jolly Good Day, and he picked up his loudspeaker. Once upon a time, there was a woman who had a dog called Latest Fashion, but it got lost while she was in the shower, and the woman ran out to the balcony, stark naked, and cried out, Latest Fashion, Latest Fashion, and after that, everyone walked around naked because they thought it was Latest Fashion. Nobody laughed at the joke. Will you please give us our youth back, asked Elva gently. But my spaceship runs on youth, said Jolly Good Day. Would you rather that I stayed here? No one answered. Are you going to remove the nail from the sun first? I don't do anything for ungrateful children, said Jolly Good Day. But only you can remove the nail from the sun, said the children. It must be removed, otherwise the children on the other side of the planet, they will die. It'll cost you to have the nail removed from the sun, kids. How much? Oh, only a single drop of youth from one child's heart, said Jolly Good Day. Pooh, that's not so much. How much youth do we have left, said the children. There's exactly a single drop of youth in each heart, said Jolly Good Day. You are mad. The last drop is irremovable from the heart. But you can easily get a heart of stone to replace it, said Jolly Good Day. But one little drop can't make any difference, said the children. You've already get a, got a full tank of youth. The last drop of youth is the most valuable of all, said Jolly Good Day. A dying king on another planet would give his kingdom for the last drop from a child's heart. We can't let you have the last drop, shouted the children. We'd rather die than get a stone heart. It's up to you, said Jolly Good Day. Either one of you receives a stone heart, or all the stupid children on the other side of the planet will die in the darkness. You are a space monster, said the children. Aren't you the ones who wanted to have fun at night and nail the sun in the sky? Yes, the said the children. Aren't you the ones who voted not to remove the nail from the sun? Yes, said the children. The majority is always right, and I only did what the majority wanted. I'm no monster. You are the monsters. You voted to let the children in the darkness remain in the darkness. It seems to me you already have stone hearts in your breasts. No one answered. If someone will volunteer to give me their last drop of youth, then I will remove the nail from the sun, and everything will be as it was before. Otherwise, I am out of here. Jolly Good Day stepped into his spaceship and was about to zoom away and burn up all their youth while jetting far into space where other planets awaited him. But then a weak voice was heard from the crowd of children. You may have the last drop of youth from my heart if you promise to remove the nail from the sun. The children gasped in amazement. It was Brimir who had spoken. Steel-hearted or stone-hearted? The children stood silently and stared at Brimir. Jolly Good Day stepped down from his spaceship and smiled. That was a wise decision. No one said anything as Brimir stepped to the front of the group. You promised to remove the nail from the sun when you have taken the last drop of my youth. I promise, 
haven't I always stood by my word, said Jolly Goodday, smiling broadly. No one else smiled. Which do you prefer, a steel heart or a stone heart? Bremer looked at the children and thought it over. If he received a stone heart, he wouldn't need any friends. If he received a steel heart, he would be indifferent to everything. I don't want any heart in exchange, he said. I'd rather die than have a stone heart or a steel heart. I'm not an evil man, said Jolly Good Day. I don't want to kill you. I'll give you a stone heart. They don't want to be your friends anyway. Jolly Good Day pressed a button on the side of his spaceship and an operating table descended with a loud crash. He pressed another button and a little mechanical drill appeared along with a vacuum cleaner. He pulled the lever on the operating table and an umbrella and a sewing machine popped up. It's a simple operation, explained Jolly Good Day. I open and close the umbrella very rapidly and this in turn drives the drill which saws a tiny little hole in your chest. The vacuum cleaner then sucks the old heart out of you and squirts a stone heart into the wound after which the sewing machine takes over and you will be as good as new. Brimir looked over his shoulder at his friends. After the rope operation, he would be cold and emotionless and without any need of friends. He looked for Hulda but could not find her. Oh, he wanted to embrace her for the last time. He lay down on the operating table and closed his eyes. Jolly Good Day took up his position and vigorously started to open and close the umbrella. The drill began to whine and descended closer and closer to Bremer's heart. Jolly Good Day's dream. But suddenly there was a shout. Wait a minute, Jolly Good Day, wait a minute. Everyone looked around. It was Hulda. What now? asked Jolly Good Day, closing the umbrella. Can't you see I'm busy? What do you dream of, Jolly Good Day? asked Hulda. What do you mean, what do I dream of? What do you dream of? asked Hulda. And she looked Jolly Good Day straight into the eye. Why do you ask me? Answer me, Jolly Good Day. He looked a bit embarrassed. I don't know, he said. I make other people's dreams come true, but nobody is interested in my own dreams. Don't you ever dream, asked Hilda. Jolly Good Day muttered, Yes, of course, sometimes I dream. About what, asked Hilda. Jolly Good Day shuffled his feet, running his toe in the sand. I dream about being a king, he muttered. What, said Hilda. I want to be a king, said Jolly Good Day, a little louder. The children looked at him and started whispering to each other. A king? Was that all? Was that his dearest wish? Some of them couldn't resist laughing. How extraordinary! Jolly Good Day looked with distant eyes into space and seemed to have lost himself in his dream. I dream of being a king in a castle with a moat full of crocodiles and a large throne and a drawbridge and a high tower from which I can see over my kingdom and shout orders to my subjects. The children were completely amazed. Were you taking our youth and making us grey-haired just because you wanted to be king in a faraway kingdom? I was hoping to sell the last drop of youth on a planet where the king is very old in exchange for me being king instead. Tell us some more about your dream, said Hulda, hoping they would gain time to save Brimir's heart. Jolly Good Day closed his eyes and talked and talked about crowns and jewels and beautiful horses. Tell us more about your dream, said Hulda, hoping they would gain some time to save Brimir. Jolly Good Day closed his eyes and talked and talked about crowns and jewels and beautiful horses and how he could ride on a coach around his kingdom and wave to his subjects with his mace. 
The children listened gobsmacked. Guys, we have to find a way to save Bremir, whispered Hulda. The children gathered together while Jolly Goodday still had his eyes closed and rambled on and on. The castle would be covered in seashells and diamonds. I have an idea that always works in fairy tales, said Magni. We have to kill Jolly Goodday. Just like trolls and dragons and witches are killed in fairy tales. Exactly, said Elva. A troll woman is turned into stone in sunlight. Witches are roasted in ovens. Dragons are slain with swords. We must kill him and save Bremir. All the children agreed. We should attack him all at once. The children got themselves ready to attack Jolly Good Day. No, no, no. He mustn't be killed, said Hulda. Why not? He's evil. Yes, he's a space monster. But he only did what we asked him to do. He granted our wishes. And if he dies, we'll never get the nail out of the sun. And the children in the darkness will die too. What do you want to do, asked the children. I have a much better idea, said Hulda. Now listen very carefully. Hulda took a deep breath and looked seriously at her friends. We shall make Jolly Good Day a king and make his dream come true, just like he made our dreams come true. The children looked at her in amazement. Are you crazy, whispered Elva. This man is very dangerous. We should put him in prison instead. The children looked at Jolly Good Day, where he stood by the operating table, his eyes closed, and a joyful look on his face. And everybody would bow for me, said Jolly Good Day. Hulda, you have gone mad. We can't let just anybody be a king, whispered the children. Don't you get it, whispered Hulda in reply. A king is just like a monkey in a cage. You just have to feed him and just have to have fun watching him, but otherwise you won't have to worry about him. Jolly Good Day continued to talk about his dream, and I would look over the land and say, this is my kingdom. We must lock him in prison, said the children to Hulda. No, said Hulda, don't you get it? It's much easier to lock him up in a castle. Jolly Good Day still had not finished his rambling, and I would have a gold crown on my head, Hulda continued, and it's much more fun to build a castle than a prison. But a king rules over everything, said the kids. We can't let him rule over us. A king rules over grown-ups. We are wild children and we do what we want. But how do we get our youth back? I have an idea, said Hulda. The children looked at each other and then at Bremir, where he lay on the operating table between the umbrella and the sewing machine, waiting for whatever would happen. Hulda cried out, Jolly good day! He came out of his trance and stopped talking about his dream. What? asked Jolly good day. Hulda took a deep breath and said, Jolly good day, you can be our king. His Majesty, Jolly Good Day. Jolly Good Day was dumbfounded. What, what do you mean I can be your king? You can be our king with a crown and a castle, with a moat and crocodiles. Jolly Good Day looked disbelievingly at the children. Are you telling the truth? Yes, said the children. You may be king of our island and us and all the animals. I can hardly believe it, said Jolly Good Day, and tears appeared in his eyes. You'll be king of the sun and the clouds and the moon and the stars and all the butterflies. Really, said Jolly Good Day. Scouts honor, said the children. Jolly Good Day's face was a picture of joy. But why do you want to make my dream come true, said Jolly Good Day. You made our dreams come true. So, of course, it's only polite to make your dreams come true. Am I king now? Yes, you may start giving orders, said Hulda. Henceforth, you bear the title, His Majesty, Jolly Good Day. Jolly Good Day smiled broadly as he disappeared into his spaceship. When he reappeared, he was wearing 
black leather boots and a wine red robe with a gold crown on his head and a massive gold mace in his hand. It just so happens I had all this in a cupboard, said Jolly Goodday, blushing a little. And then with a look of concentration, he began to rule. Subjects, you must build a castle for me. But the children looked woefully tired. Oh, we can't build a castle. See how gray-haired, old and weak we are. We'd take no time at all to build the nicest castle in the world if only we had a little more youth in our hearts. How much do you need? asked Jolly Goodday. Just a few drops, hardly worth mentioning, said the children. That's no problem, kids. I've got a tank full of youth. Jolly Goodday walked pompously to his spaceship, though with a very strange skate. He clearly wanted to hop and skip all the way. He passed Bremer, who still lay on the operating table. Subject, why are you lying here like a stranded jellyfish? Aren't you going to build me a castle? Bremer was so surprised he could only stammer. Oh, you poor thing. You're too weak to speak. Jolly Goodday dipped a spoon into the tank of youth and gave Bremer a good drink. Bremer could feel youth surge through every vein and nerve before it entered his heart. Jolly Good Day gave the other children few drops as well, and their faces became smoother, their legs stronger, and part of their grey hair became blonde or black or red. Everyone gave a helping hand, and before long, a giant white castle rose on the beach with towers and a moat full of crocodiles. Jolly Good Day glowed with happiness and went straight up to the highest tower to look out over his kingdom. Now I need stable boys and a stable, he cried. You don't need either a stable or stable boys, cried the children in reply. The horses take care of themselves and feed on the grass in the meadow. But who will fetch them for me? They'll come if you call them, said the children. What a clever system, said Jolly Good Day, and he smiled. Then he became thoughtful again. But I need servants and cooks. No need, said the children. The fruit trees grow right up to your window, and you can reach out for pineapples or apples or oranges whenever you are hungry. And penguins lay their eggs in the palace courtyard. You can fry their eggs. But what if I need meat? Seals sleep on the beach. You can knock out a seal with your mace. You don't want servants to use your mace, do you? No, I would couldn't allow that, said Jolly Goodday. I use the mace to rule with. And it is a royal sport for kings to hunt for birds and deer and salmon. You don't want servants to do that for you, do you? That's true, said Jolly Goodday. Only kings should hunt deer and salmon, not serving folk. Jolly Goodday had yet another thought. But I need guards and I need soldiers, he cried. We're all such good friends that you don't need soldiers, said the children. That's a clever idea, said Jolly Good Day. I hadn't thought of that. Jolly Good Day had another brainwave. But a chest of gold. Someone must make a chest and look for gold in the mountain and dig it up so it can be kept in the gold vault under my castle. But Jolly Good Day, you are the king of the mountain and it's much safer to keep the gold where nobody knows where it is, then you can be sure that no one can steal it from you. What a clever system, replied Jolly Good Day. I am certainly the wisest and cleverest king in the world. The children smiled at each other, and then Jolly Good Day had another thought and called out of his tower window. But where am I to keep the rest of the youth, the tank, in the spaceship could rust and leak after I've moved into the castle. You're king over us, so it will be by far safest to keep youth in the deep well of our hearts. Then there will be more than a hundred subjects safeguarding it. Jolly Good Day beamed. That's such a brilliantly good idea. Then no one can take it away from you. Jolly Good Day let the children have all their youth back and the wells in their hearts were as full as they had been before. Their faces were as smooth as baby bottoms and their hair as yellow as a sandy beach, as black as ravens or as red as fire. 
The children were smiling from ear to ear in the sunshine, but Bremer was still worried. But Hulda, Hulda, what about the children in the darkness? He whispered. Don't worry, said Hulda. She looked at Jolly Good Day and called. Isn't everything perfect now, Jolly Good Day? Jolly Good Day scratched his head. He thought and thought. At last he called out through the window. Yes, everything is perfect. But Jolly Good Day, aren't you king of moon and stars and clouds? Asked Hulda. Yes, I most certainly am, said Jolly Good Day. But how can you keep an eye on the moon and stars when the sun is fixed with a nail over the island? And how can you see your clouds when the wolf drives them away? Jolly Good Day had a good think about that. You know what, he said? I think I must remove the nail from the sun and kill the wolf. Then I'll be able to see the stars and the moon and the clouds. Jolly Good Day was delighted over his brilliant plan. I'm undoubtedly the wisest king who has ever ruled over this island. Jolly Good Day went out onto the palace courtyard and shouted up into the air, Wolf, wolf, come here right now. Then came the most awful growl that had ever been heard as the wolf shot across the sky and hoovered over them. Jolly Good Day took out his most powerful vacuum cleaner and pointed it at the wolf so that it was sucked up the tube. Then only a faint howl could be heard from within the vacuum cleaner. And since then, a distant faint howling moan can always be heard from within vacuum cleaners. Hooray for jolly good day, shouted the children. Quite soon, clouds started coming cautiously over the island again. Some were like woolly lambs and others like flying swans, and many like camels that keep water in their humps. Jolly Good Day took out his long ladder and rested it against a cloud that looked like a huge whale. His Majesty Jolly Good Day climbed up into the sky with a gigantic crowbar, and he removed the nail from the sun. Hooray, the sun is free, shouted the children. Now the day was no longer permanent, the sun continued its journey across the sky and disappeared at last beyond the horizon. The kids strained their ears. Shh! And at last they all heard the sound they had been waiting for. From far in the distance they first heard a cry of amazement and then an unbelievable shout of joy. Hooray! Hooray! The sun is back. The cheering carried from the dark side of the blue planet, which was no longer dark. The children there were welcoming the sun for the first time in a long time. Now the children in the darkness will be happy, said Hilda, smiling, because now they are the children in the daylight. The moon rose and lit up the stars. Then the voice of His Majesty, Jolly Good Day, could be heard from his tower window. Subjects, is no one going to amuse me? The children sat on the beach around a campfire and told each other poems or fairy tales about space monsters. I'm sorry, Jolly Good Day, but we're not important enough to step inside the palace, cried Hulda. Come and join us by the fire. We can tell you fairy tales, said Brimir. His Majesty Jolly Good Day came and sat with the children by the fire. They told him stories and fairy tales all night and he told them about the distant stars he had visited. They then all fell asleep in the warm sand by the fire and dreamed amazing dreams. When the children woke up the next day, the air was full of fluttering butterflies in thousands of colors. No one said a word except Jolly Good Day, who just smiled and whispered, Oh, how beautiful life can be. And this is the end of the story of the Blue Planet. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.